Narayanam Namaskitam Naram Jevanaratumam Devim Sarasatiam Basam Tito Jayodi Nashta Presho Badreshu Nityam Bhagata Sevayo Bhagati Yatamashoki Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki Nigamaka Purugaritam Param Shukamakara Metajabisamitam Tito Bhagatam Rashamarayam Mahora Hora Shikabhubhivaka Krishna Sadama Pagate Dhamakina Karona Stadi Samasha Padanako Dudamatitam Trauma Pia Dabashuta Pishatum Bibu, Samapiani and Abiram Bidukcharam Prakahi to whom Hari Dakman Sanklation Hirvana was sent in Nanyatam. And I to Pashabam Shakshad Bhakti Yoga, Lokis General Chakra Shat Bede Samitam. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dino Bandu Jagapate, Gopesha, Gopika, Kanta, Adakanta, the most to te, Jayatam Surito, Pango, Mamma Mandir, Matirgati, Matsavasha Param Bajar, Adana Madana Maharam. Sriman Rao Sarasanam Vivam Sivana Karsan Venerashan or Bhagavad Gopanata Sri Siddham Divyad Vindana Nikapadrumada Srimad Radnagara Shima Sanisto Sri Sri Rara Shida Govinda Prasada Vihe Seva Manushmanami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Thaya Cha Jigadiya Thaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha Mangalam Bhagavan Vishnu Mangalam Gurudajaja Mangalam Pari Kaksho Mangalaya Tano Hari Om Narayanaya Vidmahi Vasudevaya Dimahi Tano Vishnu Pachodi Atehe Om Mahadevi Chavidnahi Vishnu Padicha Dimahi Tano Lakshmi Pachodi Atehe Mahalakshmi Namastipyam Namastipyam Sare Sare Hari Pere Namastipyam Namastipyam Tapti Kanchana Godengi Radhe Vindavaneshwari Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priya Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pristaya Bhutare Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gurvani Pacharine Nir Vishes Sanyavari Praskita Desadharine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari <coughs> Thanks for joining me, especially after a hiatus. John Malik and Brent so far on Facebook, as well as uh, Rob Grant over there on Zoom. As you know, we went to Columbus, Ohio for a festival of colors there. It was their inaugural festival of colors. They had it at a park downtown Columbus called Genoa Park. Incredible setting. There's a river that runs right behind where the festival took place. And on the other side of the river is the skyline of downtown Columbus with the big Supreme Court building there and all this multi-level skyscrapers. Lots and lots of grass in the park, uh, an amphitheater. Um, very good arrangement by the devotees there. We were hosted by Prem Vilas and his wife Lalita. They're both physicians. They live near the temple. The temple itself is a small building they've had for 40 years now, exactly across the street from OSU, Ohio State University. Um, and they're working on a huge project. The construction started last month in August. It's an 18 minute month construction, after which they'll have a, uh, I think, 30,000 square foot temple in a suburb of Columbus called uh, Hillsdale or Hillsboro, something like that. And some of the members have bought, the temple bought 50 acres. One member bought 400 acres right across the street. Other members have bought 20 acres, 10 acres. This could be, this could evolve in due course of time to be one of the preeminent projects in all of America. So yeah, go to their website and uh, make sure you get notifications from them, see all the exciting developments that are going to um, and Sue unfold in the next 18 months. And then, you know, with, when we opened the temple here in Spanish Fork, I didn't think of it as an end result. I just thought of it as a stepping stone, rather the beginning. <laughs> Up until the time we opened the temple in Spanish Fork, my wife and I had leisure time. She for her painting and myself for marathon running. We would go to India once every couple of years, travel here and there. Once the temple opened, all that came to a grinding stop because every day tourists come, every day the buffet needs to be done, every day we have to do RT and offerings. We don't have sufficient help to farm that out to other people. 
So <laughs> there was a considerable pulling back of our freedom when the temple opened. And similarly, that temple in Columbus is going to be a, a great boon, a great step forward for the Sankirtan movement, Lord Chaitanya, but, it, it, but it's also going to be a step forward in accepting, shouldering responsibility because you can't have a facility like that. You can't have a super excellent facility and maintain it in a substandard or mediocre way. A super excellent facility demands that it be maintained in a super excellent way. Speaking of being tied down, I had booked tickets to Houston, October 12th through 14th for my wife and I to attend the leadership conference. And uh, as I look around for substitute speakers, I'm coming up zero. So we'll see if we can solve that problem. Life is all about solving one problem after another. So we'll ask uh, Jai Krishna and then perhaps maybe Joshua, if you're listening, in, you might like to give your inaugural lecture in the temple on October 15th. Brent, who's our go-to guy, is going to be in Washington, D.C. that weekend. What else can I tell? Oh, the, the Festival of Colors attracted an estimated 3,000 people. Um, the, the, the Mayapuris, Bali and his brother Kish were there. Uh, Akanksha was there leading the dancing. Uh, Janardhan was there. There was a DJ out of the Detroit uh, Harmony Collective called uh, Akanta Govinda was there. I think I'm missing somebody. But uh, yeah, it was a six-hour festival, and the Mayapuris won Janardhan, two, Akanksha, three, myself. They had the Bhangra, the performing group called, uh, what were they called, Origins, Bhangra dance group from OSU. They appeared twice for about 10 minutes each time. Other than that, there were just four of us, four entities, myself, Janardhan, the my two thirds of the Mayapuris and a Kanksha, and we we carried the ball for the whole six hours. Each each one a Kanksha appeared twice, the Mayapuris appeared twice, Janard appeared twice, the DJ appeared twice, um, and I got to sing. I have a, a repertoire of sixteen songs. I got to do twelve of them, which is an all time high, and I might say I'm getting more more confident too about myself as a performer the, you know it's easy to have festivals with a lot of dancing and a lot of chanting a lot of good prashadam and not do the straight out preaching and so i feel that's the role that i feel is that i i i do the the preaching which is um without which you don't have a complete presentation of krishna consciousness i think you'll agree with me moving on here from where we left off before the Columbus weekend, we were talking about the surroundings under which the pastimes of Gajendra ensued. He was on the heavenly planet, uh, his home where he'd been born and raised, never gone abroad, was at the foot of the Trikut Mountain. Trikut means three peaks, one of iron, one of silver, and one of gold. And there are other sub-mountain peaks as well. Um, the mountain is surrounded by an ocean of milk, and it is described in this eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, second chapter, that when the waves of the milk wash up at the base of the ocean in the north, south, east, and west directions, there are emeralds which are produced from the interaction of the base of the mountain, the raw materials, the ores of which the mountain is composed, and the lapping of the ocean of milk. So from the Srimad Bhagavatam, we have amazing descriptions of the various phenomena within this material world, what to speak of the spiritual world. Within this material world itself, it's described, there's an ocean, there are various oceans. There's an ocean of milk, there's an ocean of liquor, an ocean of ghee, an ocean of oil, an ocean of sweet water, different varieties of oceans within this universe. Now, the material scientists, while, while they may accuse us of not being able to prove these various oceans, and that's obvious because the universe is a vast area diameter, four and a half billion miles, and we just don't have the instruments. And even when you have instruments that enhance the power of our senses, you're looking through those instruments with limited senses. If I close my eyes, I can't see anything. 
I can't see any distance. I can't see anything on the other side of this wall. So those same limitations, which are inherent in our senses, um, are still going to be there even when we use instruments which amplify our sense perception. We can amplify our sense perception, but we cannot take its basic limitations off the table. You cannot amplify your senses so that they can be all-seeing, aware, cosmically conscious, as they used to say in the, in the 60s. We have limited knowledge even with our enhanced instruments. And so the scientists may laugh and deride the statements of the Srimad Bhagavatam and accuse us of being unable to prove the existence of various oceans and so on and so forth. But we come back to them and say, you can't disprove it because with all of the so-called advancements of science and technology, we know very, very little about the universe in its entirety. So we can't necessarily prove it empirically because it's these things are beyond the range of our ability to travel and to verify them, at least at the present moment, perhaps in the future, we will be able to. Uh, but neither can the scientists deny them either. Science is unable to produce a single grain of rice. Science is unable to produce a drop of water. Science is unable to produce blood or semen. So what basis does science have to categorically deny the varieties within this universe. No one, in fact, including the puffed up materialistic scientist has the ability to imitate the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One interesting reoccurring phenomenon within the Srimad Bhagavatam is that the various mountains and oceans and rivers are addressed in the masculine or the feminine. Many of them have names like Ganga. Ganga is the name of the river. Yamuna is also known as Kalindi. Kalindi, in fact, Kalindi um, was one of the wives of Lord Krishna. Ganga, the personification of the Ganga River, married King Santanu. And she was the mother of uh, Bhishma, the Trikut Trikuta Mountain here. There's a personal pronoun. He, the Trikuta Mountain, is referred to as he. This reveals a very profound truth behind the creation, which also completely eludes the materialistic scientists. The scientists take order without acknowledging an ordainer. They take it, Ishwara Ham Aham Bogi, they take it that the various elements of this material world, the beauty, the enchantment, the beguiling nature of this material world, all of this has some or other evolved by chance, that it comes about accidentally due to the random combination of atoms and molecules. The version of the Bhagavatam differs drastically from that in that every thing in nature, mountains, rivers, oceans, forests, are referred to as a he or a she. That means that behind all of the so-called impersonal aspects of material nature, there is ultimately a person. Everything can be reduced to a person. It is a person named Bhumi who is in charge of this particular planet. The sun globe itself is not impersonal energy. There is a civilization on the sun planet as there is in every single planet within this universe. That civilization on the sun planet is presided over by a president or an executive head called Vivashvan. Each mountain has a personality behind it. Take the example, for instance, of Govardhan Hill. It is said that in ancient times, Indra had an issue with the mountains, which had wings. Mountains would fly here and there. And when they would land, they would crush villages and towns and some of the favorite places of Lord Indra. Now, Indra developed an antipathy towards these flying mountains in ancient times. He employed his thunderbolt, thunderbolt, Braja, to cut the wings off of the mountains so that the mountains would fall to the ground where, where they had been divested of their wings and remain there, no longer cause havoc on the surface of the earth. So Indra had a 
an enmity towards mountains. He had a particular bias of prejudice against mountains. And in fact, um, he had the history of having cut off the wings of the mountains. So it's not by accident that Lord Krishna, during Govardhan Leela, chose to give his protection to a mountain. He's intentionally trying to irk uh, Indra. He knows Indra's triggers, and one of them is giving preference to mountains. And Krishna glorified Govardhan Hill. He told his father, Nanda Maharaj, that as an agricultural community, they had a special connection to Govardhan Hill. Govardhan Hill provided fruits and flowers. Govardhan Hill provided luscious, nutritious grasses for the cows of Vrindavan, after which eating, the cows would give milk from which they'd make butter, yogurt, cheese, and all kinds of dairy products. And Krishna gave clear preference to the mountain over and above Indra himself, who supplied rain. And the traditional sacrifice in that village had been to Indra. It was an annual event, been going on for who knows how long. And Krishna stopped it. He talked his father out of worshiping Indra. His father even went so far as to say, well, let's let's do the Indra puja, and then we'll do a separate puja for Govardhan. <laughs> but Krishna, Krishna wouldn't allow that. He insisted that the puja, which was meant for Indra, be hijacked for Govardhan so that Indra wouldn't get his puja. And as if that wasn't irking enough to Indra that he didn't get his annual puja, the fact that the paraphernalia for his puja went to one of those confounded gosh darn mountains must have really stuck in his crop. So Krishna was essentially thumbing his nose at Indra. It was inevitable that Indra would react. He was goaded by Krishna to come there. And then to add injury to insult, you might say, or insult to injury, against the best that Indra could do, Indra invoked the Sambartaka clouds, which are usually only used the destruction of the universe. The rain came down so thick it was like pillars. The temperatures dropped. The water was rising inch by inch in a very short period of time. So Krishna could have counteracted this and protected the inhabitants of Vrindavan in any number of different ways. But again, just to put it to Indra, he used the mountain to counteract Indra's power. He's really thumbing his nose here at Indra. He picks up Govardhan Hill with the little finger of his left hand, uses it as an umbrella to shelter all the inhabitants and the animals of Vrindavan from the rain and cold of Indra. They tuck under that mountain. And during the storm, which lasts for seven days, they're warm, they're dry, they're playing games, having a good time. And all of this just incenses Indra more and more. And he, he increases the severity, increases the intensity of the wind and the rain and the cold. But in spite of his best efforts, Krishna uses this mountain as a hedge against all the destructive efforts of Lord Indra. The point is that mountains, rivers, forests, planets themselves, ultimately you'll find behind each and every element of this material nature, uh, a personality, personality. Krishna further underlined this point by offering a huge feast to Govardhan. By the way, this is coming up we're celebrating Diwali slash Govardhan Puja on November 11th in Salt Lake City. Put that on your calendar. It'll start at six o'clock, go to nine o'clock. We'll have a Govardhan Hill. We'll circumambulate it within the temple. Uh, we'll offer lamps on the occasion of Diwali. We'll tell the story about Krishna having lifted Govardhan Hill and foiled Indra. There'll be fireworks. There'll be folk dancing. Um, there will be a dance performance by Nitra Nitra, a local dance group also, or maybe, no, Chitra Kavya, I think Chitra Kavya is going to perform on that day. And we've got Janardhan also coming into town for that week. Should be a wonderful festival. We're going to 
we're going to try to make it as big as possible, use the school as well as the temple. So we've got plenty of room for a couple thousand people should they show up. So Krishna offers Arti to the hill, but the hill is, is not just an impersonal combination of rocks and earth. The hill is, is a personality. So Krishna sets the tone. And in fact, we should follow Krishna's lead. We should learn what Krishna is teaching us here, that behind all the elements of nature, there's a personality. Prabhupada gives the example, electricity itself may seem like an impersonal energy. But if you follow electricity back, you'll find a powerhouse. The powerhouse was designed by engineers and constructed by architects. Um, the equipment, the generators, the powerhouses, uh, the dynamos were also conceived of, built and constructed by engineers, caretakers, and various uh, semi-professionals are required to run the powerhouse. And you always come to a person when you trace things back. The government sometimes may seem impersonal. It may seem an impersonal law, an arbitrary law that you have to drive on the right side of the road. But just try violating that law. Try driving on the left side of the road. It may seem impersonal that you're only supposed to go 65 miles an hour, 75, and not faster than that. It may seem impersonal. But just try going 90 miles an hour. It becomes personal real quick. You see the flashing lights in your rear view window. You, go, you get pulled off. A person comes at your window, asks to see your hands, your registration, your license. A person gives you a ticket. You end up in court before the personality of the judge, and you better pay the dollar amount of the fine, or else you'll, as you, you yourself as a person, will find yourself behind bars. So no matter how you might theorize about the impersonal nature of things, if you violate the laws of God, the laws of material nature, it's going to get personal and unpleasant real quick. On the other hand, rather than take an antagonistic attitude towards the uh, powerful controllers of the elements of material nature, you can take a favorable attitude, recognize them as delegates, recognize them as empowered representatives of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita says, Krishna says, those who recognize the demigods, sun god, moon god, god of water, god of electricity, the goddess of the earth planet, who recognize them and who offer sacrifice to them, um, they live very peacefully. The demigods are pleased and they continue supplying sunlight, nutrition, elements for shelter to the human society. But when you withhold when you fail to acknowledge the demigods and the oh, sovereignty of their Lord, the Supreme Personality of God of Krishna, then nature, who can potentially supply any number of resources for any size population of the Earth's planet, she will withhold her resources. Now, the choice is up to us to acknowledge the personality behind all the elements of material nature and to perform sacrifice and to live prosperously, or to fail to acknowledge them, to deny them, and experience scarcity, experience overpopulation, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> when people during the time of Maharaj Bena were prohibited from performing sacrifices, the earth held grains within her abdomen. She did not um, produce grains, even though the seeds were planted, they were watered, Everything on the part of humankind was done, but because humankind neglected to acknowledge that everything is coming from a person and to sacrifice that person, the earth withheld the seeds of the grains within her abdomen and starvation became imminent until such time as Maharaj Pritu intervened uh, to bring back those grains. In defending herself for not giving the grains, um, Bhumi said to Maharaj Pritu, you know, grains are meant for sacrifice. Yagdarta, grains are produced. Everything I produce is meant for sacrifice. Human beings are not meant to take the bounties of nature 
for granted, but recognize that they come from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, just like you don't take the light. I'm, I'm, I've got a computer here. It's running because of electricity. I've got light because of electricity. I don't take the electricity for granted. The way I acknowledge my indebtedness to the higher power that provides electricity is I pay my electric bill every month. It's not too much. It's quite reasonable. It represents a small sacrifice on my part in order to get a great benefit of having electricity. Just think of how much we're enabled to do because of electricity, but we do have to pay the small bill every month. If you don't pay the bill, if you take electricity for granted, eventually you'll flick the light switch, nothing will come on. You'll plug the computer, it won't power up. You'll, you'll turn the knob on the electric stove and there'll be no heat forthcoming, nor for the oven. We have to acknowledge that these things are coming from a higher power than ourselves. And failing to acknowledge that paves the way for demoni demonism, if that's a word, demonism, uh, uh, ingratitude, cynicism, scarcity. Um, this is described in a, a verse from the Vedic scriptures, Arche Vishnu Sirira Gurushu Naramatira Vaishnava Jati Bhutti. One who takes the elements of nature as impersonal, one who sees the guru as an ordinary person, or um, beholds the deity made of brass or marble as just an ordinary statue, not seen. The Supreme Personality of God has entered into that worshipable form and who sees a Vaishnava, someone who's chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Rama Rama, 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 as an ordinary person, um, it is said that their, their, their consciousness is hellish. And following on the heels of a hellish, atheistic, materialistic consciousness will come hellish conditions in human society as well. Hell starts in the consciousness and then manifests itself in terms of our environment. Now, speaking of environments, we're in the heavenly planets here. Our story has taken us to the place of Chikuta Mountain in the heavenly planets, place where the elephant, Gajendra, has been born, where he's raised, he's lived his whole life, and he's frolicking there, but he's not frolicking alone. It's not his abode exclusively because it's a heavenly planet. There are many other entities who also enjoy that heavenly atmosphere. Living there are Siddhas, Charanas, Gandharvas, Vidyararas, uh, divine uh, demigods, serpents, Kinaras, and Apsaras, um, the heavenly atmosphere is replete with all kinds of higher personalities. And just like in this material world, ordinary men may take time off from working in the office and go and play in the salty ocean. It's a favorite pastime of people to defuse, um, to decompress, to go on the weekend to nearby beaches or take a two-week vacation. I just did a uh, on my iFit software this morning while chanting. I went on the treadmill and I went to a French Polynesia, Magic Mountain on one of the French Polynesian islands. Uh, beaches, blue oceans, beautiful vistas, thick flora and fauna. So as ordinary men may go to the beach, or which is bordered by jungles, Similarly, the inhabitants of the demigods, they're also sporting in the area of the Trukuta Mountain because of all the beauties of nature that it has to recommend itself and swimming in the ocean of milk. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur has sung of the Lord's creation, Keshava Tuya Jagata Vichitra. My dear Lord Keshava Krishna, your creation is colorful and full of varieties. <clears throat> geologists, botanists, scientists, ast ast astronomists, and other so-called scientists can speculate about other planetary systems, but they actually have no authorized knowledge about what exists on other planets. They falsely imagine 
that all the other planets are void and uninhabitable, vacant up there just as a backdrop for whatever is going on the earth planet. Like when you were in your high school, a high school play, there was a, a backdrop, a curtain with stars on the back in their ego, self-absorption, so-called scientists imagine the other planets are uninhabited. They're just up there as decorations, a backdrop for whatever is going on in this planet. They cannot even begin to estimate the varieties which are existing throughout this universe. And that doesn't stop them, however, from being very proud of their knowledge, nor does it stop the naive public from being enamored with their formulas and their equations and their calculators and their degrees from MIT and Harvard. They have become the, the default priests of the modern age. Now, this is predicted and just foretold in the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, Shavi Varashtakari Samsuta Naya Karnapatopita Jatu Nama In the jungle, you have various animals, camels, asses. You have uh, Shavid Varasha, you have dogs, various types of animals. Now, in the, in, the, in the animal world, the big dogs, hogs, camels, and asses are followed by the smaller dogs, hogs, camels, and asses. You don't have to have any other qualification than that you just be bigger, tougher, meaner, then the other dogs, hogs, camels, and asses, that makes you a leader. That makes you stand out. So the little animals follow the big animals. And pretty much we see the same situation in the modern age. The, the ones who talk the loudest, who, who, who brag about themselves the most, who have the, the degrees from the most prestigious universities, who can talk with mumbo jumbo polysyllabic words, have bewildered and bedazzled the public in general who just take whatever drips from their mouth as absolute, as indisputable. The theory of evolution, for instance, it's just taken for granted. It's just assumed that it's a true theory when in fact there are so many holes in it. Our method is not to research knowledge, not to spin theories from our own limited brains. Einstein said, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. Our process is not what's called ascending knowledge, where we accumulate knowledge with our limited material senses, but it's descending knowledge. This is the way of getting perfect knowledge. You can't get perfect knowledge by researching with imperfect senses. You can only get perfect knowledge from the source of knowledge, the creator, the absolute truth, the Jagat Guru. And when that knowledge comes down to us from students to disciple, from the spiritual master to disciple, from spiritual master from disciple, from spiritual, when you have an unbroken chain of disciplic succession and each link in that chain is a person of impeccable character, whose only desire is to faithfully and without interpolation pass down the original enunciation, the original knowledge given by the Supreme Personality of God, then you get perfect knowledge. I may not be able to have research. I may not have the intellectual capacity or the tools to research a microphone, a microphone. Um, but if someone uh, in authority, someone who's a greater level of knowledge, tells me about the microphone, what it's for, how it's designed, and what I can use it for, then my knowledge is perfect. I don't have to do any research when those who are fully equipped with transcendental knowledge just share that knowledge with me, communicate it with me. Similarly, our duty is not necessarily to research but rather to find out those who are bona fide authorities, those who have received knowledge from the source of perfect knowledge, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and then just accept it. Example is given of the method by which mangoes are picked. Mangoes grow at quite a height. If they were to drop from their branches to the ground, 
distance of 20 or 30 yards. They would be smashed, bruised, and inedible. So in order to get mangoes, there's a chain of climbers, a chain of pickers. So that they go up the tree and the top picker grabs a mango and gives it to the next person, the next person, the next person. They pass it down carefully, hand to hand. It reaches the bottom of the tree intact and relishable, fully edible. By the way, uh, Sunil, a fellow who comes quite often to the Sunday feast, brought two mangoes yesterday that were big as footballs. <laughs> Never seen two mangoes like that before. He got them in one of the Polynesian slash Indian stores in Prof. I have no idea where they came from. Well, we receive knowledge. We don't waste time researching, but we receive perfect knowledge from the perfect source. Mahajena, Yena Gita Shapanta, Tarko Pudisham Shutio Vinir Nashodi Shir Matir Vinamya, Dharmasha Tadvaru Mahajena Yena Gita Pishanam, Tarko Pudisham Shutio Vinir. Our research tool is not the microscope or not the telescope, um, but it is hearing. These, these are our scientific tools for doing research as the origin and nature and maintenance of the universe in which we live. For finding out things which are beyond the range of the eyes, the tongue, the nose, and the sense of touch, the ears are the most powerful instrument that we have for acquiring knowledge. And when we hear from a perfect source, our knowledge gets perfect. Prabhupada gave the example that if you look at the sun with your naked eyes, it may look like a globe, maybe 150 miles in diameter, maybe 25 miles away. The real way to look at the sun is by hearing about it through authorized books of astronomy. The sun is 93 million miles away, so many times bigger than the earth. It emits uh, this much of energy every second. Then having heard about the sun from an authorized source, then your seeing becomes perfect. In other words, the best way to understand this world is to see through the ears, jnana chakshu. Therefore, it is said, mahajena yena gita sabanta, following the path of the previous acharyas. We needn't reinvent the world. We invent the wheel. And look at the, 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 the area of science, each scientist wants to make his own bones. He wants to make a name for himself. And in order to do so, he has to criticize and discredit what the other scientists have created. So every scientific treatise pretty much will, will contest the conclusions and the methods of every other scientific treatise. And so it's a it's an arena of conflict, of envy, of competition. It has nothing to do with the pure, uh, sincere uh, quest for the absolute truth, which is at the core of every living being's heart. So some of the heavenly planets, heavenly denizens, who are sporting in the same recreational area as Gajendra, are first called the Gandharvas. Gandharvas are those who praise Krishna through songs. If someone sings nicely in India, they'll say, oh, you sing like a Gandharva. So the Gandharvas are the heavenly planets. They use their voices, their beautiful God-giving voices to honor the Supreme Personality of God. Note, they're not taking anything for granted. They're not uh, buying into a mechanistic, atheistic creation of the universe they're pure enough to recognize that we are what god has made us we're fashioned by the hand of the almighty unique uh, sons and daughters of the almighty lord so those who are elevated souls who live in the higher planets are pretty much across the board krishna conscious and each one honors God according to the talents and abilities that God has endowed them with. Now, the Gandharvas, all, they're called Gandharvas because they're gifted with beautiful voices and they sing beautiful songs honoring Krishna. Another category of heavenly denizen of the Vidyadharas. Vidya means knowledge. 
they honor Krishna um, through knowledge. They speak beautiful words. Inami pumsas tapasa sutashiva sutasya sutasya chaburida avichadro yadu tamashoka ganana The Bhagavatam says, if you have a, if you have a good education, if you have a good brain, if you have a a, a good fund of knowledge, then Udamashoka Vartya, you should use that knowledge, that brain, that uh, uh, elite vocabulary in order to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> um, the Apsaras, Apsaras are heavenly denizens who are very expert in dancing and they glorify the Lord through dancing. So whether it be singing or through um, quoting beautiful, beautiful, honorific slokas, or whether it be dancing, all the um, inhabitants, all the, the recreationalists in that Trikuta mountain area um, glorified the Lord. And when they look down on earth planet, they feel so much empathy. They feel so saddened to see our situation on this lower earth planet and the situation of those who are on the planets even lower than us. The universe is divided into upper planets, middle planets, and lower planets. We're describing everything that we're describing about Gajendra happened on the upper planet. We ourselves live in the middle planets, and then there are lower planets where conditions are even more hellish. But the denizens of the higher planets with their relatively long life, their relative freedom from disease and old age, and their relatively high standard of living, they look down on our situation. Treat, treat, hunger and thirst. They see the hunger and thirst with which we're afflicted. Um, everything grows spontaneously on the heavenly planets. They haven't got to toil, foam at the mouth, get down on their knees in the hot sun. All fruits and grains and vegetables, just basically, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. It's just there. You do pious activities here on earth. You stockpile your punya, then you take your next verse in the heavenly planet, and you haven't got to work particularly there. But here, we've got, we're plagued by, and we're always trying to work to create a hedge against these miseries. And here they are, it's pretty much a list of the um, inconveniences, the afflictions with which um, we're assailed in this middle and lower planetary system. Sutrit tritabir. Tritabir means we're in bodies made of mucus, bile, and phlegm. The bodies of the demigods are made of finer, finer, more rarefied stuff. Um, um, our demonum, we're always perplexed. Just take the material scientists in the name of research, in the name of philosophy, they haven't got a clue. And then Sita Ushna, Sita is winter, Ushna is summer. Sometimes winters are very harsh and summers are very um, scorching, more so now with what they call climate change. And then Bata, winds, hurricane season, there are places in California and New England um, and Texas and uh, Caribbean islands, which this year were hit with hurricanes that haven't been hit with hurricanes in their entire history. Rains, flooding, itarata, and many, many other distresses are inherent uh, in this middle and lower planetary systems. And aside from the external powerful things that come against us from a Devi Prakriti, material nature, there are our own Kamesha, Krodesha, Rajagunisha, Mahasanamab, Vidyanam, even within us, our greatest enemies do not come from outside, but the things that perplex us and burn us um, and afflict us come from the inside. Kamagnina, the strong sex surge, which is irrepressible and irrecontrollable. Most crimes, murders happen because of sex uh, in one form or another. And then achuta rusha, indefatigable anger, how persistent, how always just below the surface. 
anger lurks and under the slightest pretext even the, the even the smallest offense real or imagined anger is ready poised coiled to spring up and manifest its ugly head well it is said that into that environment and to relieve the living ben beings who are suffering in a multitude of ways the lord occasionally appears yada yada hi dharmasha glinder bhavati abhutanam adharmasha tadatmanam sujamiham to relieve the living beings from all these various afflictions and at least get them to live in the mode of goodness and accumulate pious activities so that they can join the demigods in the heavenly planets and joining the demigods in the heavenly planets they'll be playing instruments they'll be singing they'll be dancing they will join in the chorus of praise the symphony of mantras and songs for the pleasure of the supreme lord of all the world's material and spiritual lord sri krishna the supreme personality of godhead that's our time for today uh, if you're here with us you know that we've resumed our series of shows we're going to call this the 40th segment i have no idea how many segments we've done it's at least the high 30s um we've done 40 45 minute segments on gajendra and we have much more to share with you as well resuming tomorrow on transcendental tuesday here's a here's another uh rob you're not on facebook so i'll read this to you Carmen says, not the highest nor the lowest, but the trickiest. Earth is the birth in which we earn our worth. Interesting. Not the highest nor the lowest, but the trickiest. Earth is the birth in which we earn our worth. Good use of verses. Thank you. Krishnadas Tarachan great picture oh that's our lake here at kusham Shrover. that's the lake behind me there sundari priya glories of Prabhupada, bhakti gary john from kenya yeah carmen brent john malik and rob rob what have you got for us this morning i hope that your um your talent at putting words together did not get rusty during the 10 days or so that we we um did not come onto the air let's see Hare krishna Prabhuji. i didn't get much today i have my hands full with a, a sick child so hopefully the ones i got are, are decent <laughs> uh we're all part of the spiritual spark Boctify your intelligence and achieve transcendence. What was the worst first word? Boctify. Oh, boctify your intelligence. And then what? And achieve transcendence. Okay. Boctify your intelligence. Nice. Um, nice on the spiritual plane. On the spiritual plane, there's no need to strain. Nice. Uh, even, even on the in what to speak of the spiritual, just even the heavenly planets, life is so much easier than it is here then we can only imagine what it's like in the spiritual world any more and uh i like no that was it i i really like the uh was that carmen that did the that one on facebook yeah let me just uh she says uh not the highest not or the lowest but the trickiest earth is the birth in which we earn our worth and it's true we don't we don't actually create our future either in the heavenly planets or the hellish planets we spend in the heavenly planets we spend the accumulation of good results which we've accrued on the earth planet and if we're in the hellish condition on the lower planets we're similarly spending the negative reactions of the bad decisions we've made while we're human beings and so karma kicks in only in these middle planetary systems there's there's no accrual of karma for the demigods nor is there for those living in hellish planets they're just spending the good and bad results and so in fact yes this is this is the arena where we create our destiny we can either sink down 
and go lower. We can go relatively higher within this material world, but then the problems of birth, death, disease, and old age are still unsolved. Or we can make Krishna the center of our lives and go back home, back to God, and never again to take birth in either the middle, the lower, or the, even the upper planetary system of this material world. Good point. Okay, we'll let you guys go. Do what you have to do today. And reminder that always remember Krishna and never forget him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama, Rama. Hare Hare.